Hello, and welcome to Middlebury Edition. I'm Middlebury Representative Robin Shai, your host for the program. Middlebury Edition was created primarily for the purpose of educating Middlebury residents about local services and the Vermont Legislature, and to provide an opportunity for legislators and area nonprofit organizations to talk about their work. Today's guest is Senator Ruth Hardy, who is one of two senators representing Addison County in the Vermont Legislature. This is Ruth's second term as senator. In her first term, she sat on the Senate Education and Senate Agriculture Committees. This term, Ruth is on Senate Finance, and she's also Vice Chair of the Senate Health and Welfare Committee. Additionally, she is on several joint committees and work groups and is currently co-chair of the Task Force on Pupil Waiting for Education Funding. So she's a busy woman, and we have lots of things to talk about today. Welcome, Ruth. Thank you, Robin. <laughs> yeah. Thanks for having me. It's so great to have you here and fun to talk about what's going on in the legislature yeah. in the state of Vermont. <laughs> so let's start by talking about your off-session work. And so just for clarification, the legislature meets each year the first week of January to approximately the third week in May. So off-session means the work you're doing while the legislature is officially out of session. So what have you been up to? Yeah, well... <laughs> So since June, well, we, we ended the session in May, and, and since June, um, I've been meeting with three of my committees. Um, one, a special task force, which you mentioned, on the school finance funding formula, which mm -hmm. we, we can talk about more in depth later. Yep. Um, but I co-chair that, and that has been an enormous amount of work. Yeah. Um, I, I've also been a member of the State House um, Committee advisory committee um, that has been advising on our going back to the state house right. and how do we go back to the state house safely mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. obviously you know that we were remote for uh, the last session and a half and worked via zoom but now we're hoping to go back in person next session mm -hmm. so really needing to make sure that the state house is organized and set up in a way that's safe for legislators and the public and our staff and anybody who's going to be in the building. Um, and then finally, the Senate Finance Committee has been meeting a couple times um, to go over some tax um, proposals that mm -hmm. came to us last session that we needed to really spend a little bit more time on. So that's my legislative work. I, I also am the mother of three children, so I've been trying to spend more time with my family and mm -hmm. um, especially during the pandemic, just really wanting to make sure I connect with um, my family and um, finally I'm teaching a class at Middlebury College um, on women in US electoral politics so I have 21 um, students wow. and really digging into broadly speaking um, women in politics in the United States um, and what is the status of women in politics and and really um, how why it's important that we have women um, in elected office and uh, how we've been successful and not so successful in that area. So it's been really fun to be on campus, um, yeah. although it's a weird session, semester there. Yeah. Um, you're all masked while you're in class. And yeah, like that. yeah. we're all masked and, um, you know, but we have been meeting in person and I do, at the beginning of the semester when it was still warm, we would go outside so mm -hmm. we could see each other's faces and that was yeah. nice. Um, but it's really nice to be um, with you know, young people who are interested in politics and, and feel like I can help, you know, fuel their excitement and, mm -hmm. and help them understand what's going on nationally. And my experiences and the experiences that I've uh, gained both as an elected official and then my previous work training women to run for office. Right. So that's been oh, That's fun. great. I yeah. bet it's been fun. They're lucky to have you with that kind of oh, experience. So you. that's that's great. And you know, you, you mentioned Zoom and we're all pretty familiar with Zoom now. And yeah. uh, we spent la the whole last session on Zoom and, op and operating that way, which was tough for everybody, as we know. Uh, except for the commute, it was tough for, <laughs> for yeah. everybody. And the state, and I actually watched some of the committees that you mentioned uh, on Zoom this summer because, and the public should know that you can watch any of our uh, committee meetings yeah. on Zoom. You go to the General Assembly website and you can find the committee and there's a link on all of uh, them to the, to the different meetings. So, so you don't have to drive to Montpelier even if the committee members are meeting in Montpelier. And so yeah. the, the State House one, I, I watched a few of those because uh, I'm very interested. Obviously, I, we all have a personal yeah. interest in what's going to happen. And um, 
Uh, is there going to be some a little bit of construction done? We haven't. I don't think we've decided yet whether we're going to have a hybrid going back or what are some of the recommendations that came out of yeah. that? Yeah. Well, the recommendations. <laughs> we started our work in June when things were actually better, and everyone was really right. optimistic that we'd come over the hump and we were going to be done with the pandemic. And then by the time we made our recommendations in September, we were in the midst of Delta, right. and. So even within that three month, things changed, right. and now they're changing even more. So, the, I think the specific recommendations may not actually be what we implement, yeah. but the general implement uh, recommendations of we need, especially for some of the house committees that have a lot of members in the room, we need right. bigger rooms for them. So we're going to be moving committees around mm -hmm. in the state house. Um, we're going to try to limit some of the events that happened in the state house um, so there won't be as many people there yeah um, whether or not we require masks is still up in the air how we deal with um, vaccinations is still up in the uh. air um, and we are also moving forward with trying to um, actually expand the state house yeah. and this was a conversation that we've been having uh, prior oh, to years. both of us yes <laughs> for years, years we've and been years talking about our this. state house right. is quite small yeah and it doesn't meet the needs of legislators and our staff and most importantly the public, public right so we're trying to um, move that forward and hoping that we might be able to take advantage of some of the federal money to um, expand the state house and make it a much um, safer and more pleasant place to be. I mean, when it gets really busy, you can't even walk through the oh, state house no. without, you know, getting stuck in yeah. a crowd or whatever. And it's not very accessible, um, physically accessible right. or whatever. So I think that we might be able to take advantage of this opportunity yeah. and and move forward with making the state house a better place to be. Um, I, we also are on um, almost certainly going to be hybrid in some yeah. way. So one of the things our tech staff at the state house has been amazing during the pandemic. Yes, they have. It just fast. We are fantastic. so lucky to have them. Yeah, and our, our our actually tech director Kevin Moore won a national award for um, through the oh, National really? Conference of State Legislatures for his work getting us up online so quickly and so app effectively. Yeah. And so I think that will continue um, yeah. in some form. And they're testing out microphones and cameras for all the committee right. rooms. So as you said, you can get to all of our meetings via YouTube, find the links online. You can subscribe now to each individual uh, no. committee. Yes. <laughs> um, so it's really just getting very high tech. And yeah. other states are actually reaching out to Vermont to find out how we did it. Yeah. Um, so. I, I think that will continue, yeah. and so people won't have to come to the state house um, as right. much. Which, which I think is a good thing because you know if you're driving from Brattleboro to give 20 minutes of testimony and you've driven two hours in one direction, yes. uh, and we used to do it by phone. I remember in you know in my committees we've done that, uh, but if you can do it. Um, by a Zoom, and so you, there's a face, yeah. and you feel like you're actually more part of the committee. Um, so I think short term we've got um, changes in the way committees are going to be looking. And I sit on House Appropriations, which is one of the big committees that people like yeah. to sit in on. So I think we'll probably end up in a bigger room. I think so. Um, and then the medium to long term is how do we expand the state house, which requires actual bigger construction yes. issues. Yes. So and that will take a few years. We also yeah. have some satellite space that we'll be using next That's session, right. um, moving some staff around and yeah. having some meeting rooms outside of the state house. Um, so. I don't know how it's all going to come out, but right. I, I think it will be, you know, a work in progress, but still better than it has been. Yes. Yeah. And safer for everybody. Yeah. So let's switch gears and talk about one of your other groups. You're co-chairing the Pupil Waiting Task Force, and yeah. that is full of emotion and angst on the part of the, everybody in the state is interested in public education. Yeah. And uh, you all are, are uh, leading the way based on this report that came out a couple of years ago. So tell us a little bit about that. Yeah. Oh, you'll have to stop me if I get into too many weeds because it's really complicated. <laughs> it is. <laughs> but two years ago, as you mentioned, well, actually in 2019, yeah, just at the end of 2019, a report came out that the legislature had actually commissioned mm -hmm. about um, what we call uh, the pupil waiting factors in our school finance funding formula. And this is how much do we, in our formula, account for different types of students. Right. 
So uh, if, for example, an, an elementary school student is one, uh, one pupil, um, a high school student is currently weighted as 1.13. And that is because it's more expensive to um, educate a high schooler because of the specialized labs and you know, mm -hmm. more teacher types of teachers they need. Right. And then there's also a weight for students living in poverty uh, who also need more resources mm -hmm. and students who are English language learners. Yeah. There's a weight for uh, preschoolers as well, but that wasn't part of the study. So we asked um, uh, researchers at the University of Vermont and Rutgers University, are the weights that we have in our formula right now the right weights? Mm -hmm. And are there others that might we might need to add? So the study came out in 2019, and the short answer is the weights are not sufficient, and there are others that we should consider. Right. Um, and it's complicated because we have a very complicated school funding formula, yes. one of the most complicated in the country, and also an incredibly unique funding formula where we're one of only two states that has a funding formula that's called a tax equalization formula. Huh. And that yeah. formula came into effect in the late 1990s as right. the result of the Brigham decision, right. um, which came out of Addison County, yeah. um, saying that towns, uh, the towns that have less tax base and let fewer resources, the poorer towns were not able to raise as much in taxes as the wealthier towns. Right. Um, and so this decision equalized the, um, it led to Act 60, um, in the late 1990s that right. equalizes the, the ability for towns to raise taxes for each pupil. And therefore have a more equal education for all students, access to an equal education. Exactly. So it was yeah. based on the, our, our constitution requires access to uh, K-12 education. And so how do we equalize that, whether somebody's coming from Stowe or Whiting, right. basically those two extremes. And um, our formula does that very well. We, are, we have one of the most equitable formulas in the country. Mm -hmm. But layered on top of that was this concept of weighting different pupils. And it's a little bit of a mismatch that form, the pupil weights usually go with a different kind of school funding formula. So what we're trying to do is how do we blend these two formulas, these two concepts, yeah. do it well, do it equitably, equitably, also with all the changes that have happened over the last 20 years since right. the Brigham decision, right. since um, Act 60, um, our state, our pupil, uh, our enrollments have declined significantly right. by more than 25%, I believe. Yes. Um, we have had a diversification of our pupils. We have more students who are, need English language learning. Mm -hmm. um, we have um, more students spread out who are in poverty. Yeah. Um, and um, we also had Act 46, which changed the structure and governance of our schools. So all of those factors, plus of course the pandemic over the last couple yes. of years, have had a huge impact on our schools and mm -hmm. our funding. Yeah. So we're trying to take all that into consideration plus manage our complicated but very equitable formula um, mm -hmm. and make it even better. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so we spent, right. we were authorized 12 meetings in the off session to try to figure out how to implement changes. Um, we spent the first six meetings getting up to speed, making sure there yeah. are eight of us, there are four senators and four house members, yeah. making sure all of us are on the same page with our knowledge and our understanding of our current situation our understanding of the report. So we took a lot of testimony from the authors of the report, from experts across the state on school fin finance, um, things like special education, um, English yeah. language learning, et cetera. And now we're mm -hmm. trying to come up with recommendations. Um, so it's been a huge task. Yeah, <laughs> right. Be yeah, and so is, is a lot of it going to be sort of rearranging the, um, all the taxes, the property taxes, go into the state, who then redistributes them to the towns based on the budgets that are passed by the town. So the towns still determine what their budgets are, right? Uh, and then they get the funding from the state. So this this would um, provide opportunities to sort of rearrange how much towns are able to get if they have, for example, more English language learners or more students that are in poverty. They might get more money than they've been getting in the past. Is that is that sort of right? Sort of right, yes, yeah. basically, except for, so what, 
what because of our our formulas based on tax equalization what mm -hmm. if we give them more equalized pupils because they have few, more students in poverty right. or more ELL students than another district they will get greater tax capacity right and then the town can decide or the school district actually right. can decide whether they use that tax capacity to either spend more money on students or to have a tax reduction right. in their in their tax rate right and that's where it becomes complicated. As you mentioned, we have local control. Budgets are decided at the local level. They're right. passed by school boards and then approved by voters. And then the state funds whatever school districts say they need. Um, so really making sure that if we give school districts more tax capacity, that they use that tax capacity to actually improve the outcomes of st for students. Yeah. That's really where it's tricky. And so are pupil weights the best mechanism to do that is one of the questions. Yeah. Or are there other mechanisms right. um, and to that's, do that? And that's sort of tricky, too, because you know nobody's questioned the, the school districts that have gotten more money over the years on whether they're using the money appropriately. I mean, at the end of the day, it all comes down to being a local decision. And I'm wondering if... Um, I think I heard, was hearing concerns about, you know, are there going to be winners and losers in terms of school districts, and some may have more taxing capacity now and some may have less, right? So how does that affect our schools in Addison County, our school districts? Do you yeah. know yet, or is it too early? Uh, yeah, we sort of know. Um, and I guess I would push back a little bit about uh, the whole concept of nobody's asked school districts. They have. Um, we have um, uh, education quality standards that right. school districts are supposed to meet. Um, we have uh, lots of uh, means by which we determine whether schools are, are providing an equitable education uh -huh. and using their funding well. Um, so I think all school districts have been asked, yeah. all of them, regardless of where they fall in this. Right. Um, and all of them okay. will continue to be asked. Right. And so I think that sort of concept of, well, nobody's ever asked other districts, certainly that's what the school board's jobs are, is to ask, right. why, why are we doing this? and the Agency of Education and the members of the public. So I think all school boards and districts have been asked. Yeah. Um, but yes, for Addison County, I like to say that we are sort of the quintessential middle class um, uh, county. Mm -hmm. um, our districts are not um, on the level where they're really poor and have a lot of students in poverty, right. relatively speaking. We're also not the wealthy districts right. that have a lot of um, wealthier students and you know lots of uh, high value um, property so we're sort of in the middle yeah and so um, what will in the models that we're running Addison County especially the northern part of the county kind of comes out almost equal yeah. that depending on what factors we use mm -hmm. they're up a little or down a little yeah the district that would have the biggest impact is ACSD. Um, ours, Middlebury. Ours, middle, the Middlebury <laughs> district. Because it, of the three districts, it is actually the district that has that is the wealthiest of yeah. the three. And so um, they would see um, probably a, a, a sort of negative impact in terms of the lower, uh, lower tax yeah. capacity. Yeah. Um, but we are looking into, we're, we have made no final decisions. Right. And of course, whatever we recommend then goes to the full legislature. Sure. Um, but we also w are looking into ways to phase it in, other ways to mitigate the impact, um, ways to make sure that we don't have extreme losers and extreme right. winners, um, that we all are in it together, right. because we really are yeah. all in it together, especially the way we fund schools in Vermont. Right. So a lot of work to be done, and it's complicated. Yeah. And uh, thank you for giving us an update. We'll look forward to seeing what happens in yeah. the legislature. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> um, so let's move to the next session. Okay. We start up again in January, the first um, Tuesday, I think, in January. Yep. So um, sort of broadly, what are the issues that you see as important for the next session? Yeah. So um, as you know, on the Appropriations Committee, we still yeah. have a lot of the ARPA um, money left to yeah. appropriate and figure out how we're going to spend. Plus now this new infrastructure bill, which is being signed by the president today. Right. Um, so we'll have a, a, a lot of decisions to make about the use of federal funding. And also to look back on how we spent pr the federal funding in the spring and mm -hmm. whether that's working. Um, so. I think some areas that we will have a special focus on um, are some of the same ones we did before, but yeah. housing continues yeah. to be a vexing problem throughout yeah. our state. 
um, and including here in Middlebury and Addison County. Um, uh, broadband, we've made some really great progress in broadband yeah. and I'm hoping we can continue with that. Um, and uh, education and child care. Child care, <laughs> yeah, that's the one I keep hearing about. Yeah, child care is really struggling right now. Mm -hmm. We're in a crisis situation with yeah. child care. And so I'm sure we'll be spending more time thinking about and, and hopefully providing funding, especially to, to help our child care providers right. themselves. Um, right. so Because that affects our businesses too and their ability yeah, to hire staff. I mean, child care is a huge problem. So, absolutely. Yeah. And because we're still in the pandemic, I think there are other issues in terms of health care and, mm -hmm. and really just support for um, our citizens and um, mental health services yes. is another really big one that yeah. I think we'll end up tackling. Yeah. And so that leads me to issues in your own two committees. Yeah. Um, and so health, you have, you're vice chair of health and welfare. Yeah. So that must, so mental health will be coming up mental in your health, own committee? Mental um, health, absolutely. And um, changes uh, it, sort of broadly under the umbrella of health care reform. Um, but I don't think we're going to be able to tackle full-fledged health care reform in this right. session. But I think we will be looking at ways to make our system more equitable mm -hmm. and more effective. Um, and um, I also am l working on an, a series of bills that are about um, helping moms. <laughs> okay. um, for example, expanding um, postpartum um, coverage for, um, uh, for lower income mothers, um, how much support and coverage they get after mm -hmm. their after they have a baby, yeah, um, and um, maternal mental health and issues that will hopefully, and, and child care yeah. and things that will help um, moms in particular. <laughs> Which help families and children <laughs> exactly. and the rest of our community and exactly. our society. So that's exactly. great. That's yeah. great. And then, yeah, and then in finance, we'll, we, that's the committee in the Senate that actually deals with broadband. <laughs> oh, okay. Interesting. <laughs> so we, we did the big broadband oh. bill last session, and yeah. we'll, we'll probably take uh, more work on that as well. And yeah. um, energy and technology is also goes through that committee, um, so uh, sort of uh, utility yeah. regulation and that kind of thing. And then we have some major tax proposals on the um, on the table that came up to us from the house yeah. one is about corporate income tax and how we deal with corporate taxes mm -hmm. and the other about cloud taxes um, and that's yes. taxing things on in the cloud which more and more of us are using right. online services instead and, of buying a cd and sticking it into your computer you, right right so those things we'll be tackling um, and then the pupil waiting task force will come to the finance committee that whatever okay. we recommend right we'll go through both education and House Ways and Means and Senate Finance, right. so that will be a big issue for us as yeah. well. I can imagine. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Yeah. Well, we're going to have a bit, and it's the last um, session, the second year of our biennium, so all bills that don't um, get passed by both bodies, the House and the Senate, um, end. And they, so there's not, you don't pick it up again the next session, it sort of goes back to zero, and I'm sort of educating the public here that, you know, yeah. that we have to um, create new bills for the next biennium. So. It, this session becomes that much more important to get those certain bills across the finish line so we don't have to start all over again. Right. It so. becomes much faster the yeah. second year yeah. of the session. And right. We also, I don't know if we have time, but we have a lot of other big issues that yeah. are coming up. Redistricting. That's right. Um, pensions. Pensions. Proposition 5, constitutional changes, amendments. So yep. there's a lot, and um, we don't have time, but we'll have you back. Yep. Uh, so uh, we're going to wrap up now, and if there's anything else you'd like to say or how people can reach you if they um, if they need to, your ledge email. Or... Sure, yeah. Um, you can reach me at my legislative email, rhardy at ledge.state.vt.us, which you can find online. Um, my phone number is also online. Um, uh, I get hundreds and hundreds of emails a day, so I will try to get back to you. You can That's also great. sign up on my website for my email list, which a lot of people get. Um, and just want to make sure everybody takes care of themselves during this really difficult right. time. And Thank you for watching. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks for coming. Thanks for being on the show, Ruth. That's it for now. My guest today has been Senator Ruth Hardy, one of two state senators for Addison County. Thanks to MCTV for, for producing the show. Thank you for watching, and we hope to see you next time.